We good? All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Why does my chair feel like I'm falling there? Hold on. <laughs> All right, cool. Thank you very much. Um, good morning again. I am Kenneth L. Herman, Jr., Chief HR Officer for Fulton County. Uh, and today we continue the journey of Fulton Gets Financially Fit. Um, I am honored that, you know, for those of you employees who were able to make it in person, thank you very much for uh, joining us uh, for the two to 300 or so employees online. Again, thank you very much for taking time out of your day to have this very important conversation that is really about you. Uh, it's not about county operations, not about customer service. It's really about the county doing our best to prepare you for that uh, financial freedom that we all are seeking and, you know, creating generational wealth and the like. And that's the intent of the financial fit series that we've developed within the, the HR department for the employees of Fulton County. Now, today we're joined by a very dynamic a uh, couple, as I was telling them today, you know, we talk about breaking the glass ceilings. Well, they've opened the book of, of secrets of how they have navigated the financial world. And I would say I'm very, um, uh, not an extreme income, but a modest income, be, be able to transition from work to retirement or basically following their passions. Uh, so today we have the Saunders, who are, are, are and, and the beauty of it is they're right across the bridge in Smyrna. So, so it's not that we flew anyone in. This is an Atlanta couple right here in Georgia that has made the transition and have leveraged all the tools, tips, and tricks available to maximize their uh, financial well being to set them up to be um, on the path of financial independence. And that's really and truly why we invited them today. So, um, without uh, further ado, uh, well, before that, because I always get in trouble when I try to wait to the end, I, I also, also want to thank my team in the Employee Development Unit, Virginia, Brenda, Danny, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Gary and Jeff, uh, for making this possible because there's a lot of work behind the scenes to pull these kind of things off, you know, and I always stress their, um, stress them out and push them you know, so now we, they've learned how to do stuff on YouTube and stream. So, you know, this is a benefit for you as well uh, for the employees. So thank you guys very much for that. So I'm going to stop talking right now. I'm going to pull up my notepad because I am learning just like you are learning uh, some of the things that I need to do that I have not done over the last 22 plus years of my career uh, to leverage and ensure that I am financially uh, fit uh, to make the next transition. And I'm hoping that you take away uh, from today's conversation and then the follow-up question and answer series and then the follow-up individual training sessions, uh, what it will take for you to make it happen uh, for yourselves and your families and for the generations that uh, will come after you. So uh, again, thank you very much, uh, the Saunders, for joining us today. And I will turn it over to you guys. Thank you so much, Ken. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, good morning. This is the first time I've been on the highway uh, driving through rain in a really long time. And so I was thinking about the other people who've probably driven <laughs> to get here and, and just thinking about how tough that can be. So I'm so grateful for everyone that was able to make it here. Even if you weren't driving, we know it's kind of an ugly day. So we're hoping that we can make this a little bit more interesting. We're also uh, very much aware that money is not only a taboo subject, uh, it's one that makes people a lot of uh, very intimidated and uncomfortable. And so we are not those kinds of financial speakers or experts. So we really hope to break the mold and make this a little bit more fun and a little bit more fluid. Uh, my name is Julian. Uh, this is Kirsten. Good morning. Um, online uh, and in certain parts of the world or in the financial media world, we go by the, uh, the name Rich and Regular. Uh, that is our way of saying uh, we are not rich and famous. Uh, we do not want to be, uh, and the next best thing to being rich and famous is being exactly what we are trying to be and what we're inspiring other people to be as well, rich and regular. We want you to know that you can be that without being absolutely extraordinary, without having the last name Kardashian, without going to play in sports leagues, any of those things. There are simple ways that everyday people can build wealth immediately. And so that is our passion, is something that we have uh, been 
talking about and doing and living and embodying over the last uh, 10 years. We do have a presentation. I'm, I'm hoping we can pull that up. Uh, we're going to walk you through a couple of things that are central to our book, which is right here. Uh, and we're going to give out two copies of our book today. Uh, this book came out uh, last month, June 14th, uh, conveniently right uh, in between uh, or before Juneteenth uh, and Father's Day. Uh, it's entitled Cashing Out, Win the Wealth Game by Walking Away. Uh, it's a project that took three years <laughs> to, 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 to complete. We started this project in 2019. Were you going to say something? No, I was just going to say it was Echoing, a labor of yeah. love, a three-year labor of love. Labor of love. Um, so we're going to walk you through a couple of those um, slides. Uh, but briefly, I just want to introduce who we are in a little bit more detail. And so first, yeah, I thought the clicker. OK, thank you. So as I mentioned, we are authors uh, of Cashing Out. We're also entrepreneurs, uh, and we likely have several other businesses under our belt that we will start, even though my wife hates when I say that. Um, we are uh, investors. We are passive investors primarily, and we'll talk a little bit about that. In terms of uh, where we rank, well, we actually don't like talking about that kind of thing, but to put it in perspective, our net worth, which is one of the most uh, important uh, measures of financial health uh, is in the upper 90th, I'm sorry, is in the 90th percentile, shouldn't say upper, because that's a huge difference. Um, we are also the hosts of a series called Money on the Table. Uh, if you've ever watched the Food Network or if you've ever watched Travel TV, uh, this is our way of trying to make talking about money a little bit more fun. And so in season one of that series, we basically, it's like we're inviting you to a dinner party. We sit back, we cook a meal, we enjoy that meal, and then we engage in a financial conversation because that's how we know a lot of people like to talk or learn about money anyway. We also have a podcast, which is sponsored by Success Magazine. And sometime this year, we crossed over that 1 million download, which we are very, very proud of. Um, so when we think about all that we're doing from our books to speaking to workshops to our podcasts, we really boil that down to one very simple mission, and that's to inspire better conversations about money, better conversations about money. And so if you're thinking about that, you might be saying, well, what could make a conversation about money better or what's wrong with the way that we talk about money today? And there are a long list of things that I think uh, get in the way of us having better conversations about money. And I'll just talk about a few of them. One, when you think about your time horizon, most of us believe that as a child, you don't work. Uh, well, that depends on where, you, where you're from, right? <laughs> but as a child, you don't work. And then finally, you go to school, you get a job, and these are your working years. And when you retire, you don't work after that. You do not earn money. If you do, you're not considered retired. And that's just fundamentally not true. We know that children can work. Obviously, there are limitations there. We also know that seniors or retirees can work, and they still can earn income. And so we want to make sure that we don't lock ourselves into these rigid timelines with respect to money. Money and earning income. Another thing that I think could make uh, inspiring better conversations about money is if we didn't think in terms of binary code. If you've ever seen uh, the movie The Matrix, or if you can recognize what that green screen is, the zeros and ones, we've learned, particularly in American culture, that people think about money in one or two ways. And you can tell by the way that they frame up questions. Should I do this or that? Should I uh, buy this or that? Should I invest in this or that? The reality is we know that like most things in life, life is very dynamic, right? So we have to appreciate all of the good things that happen in between. Another thing that I think could make talking about money better is if we avoided all of these labels. How many people have ever heard someone refer to themselves as a spender by a show of hands? or a saver. Some people may say, well, I'm a saver. That person is a saver. The reality is everybody is a saver and a spender, right? No one is any one thing, right? At some point you have to spend money and to spend that money, you likely had to save money. So we should, again, start ditching some of those labels. Another thing, as you can tell by that big rule of thumb, Americans love rules of thumb. 
We like to be told exactly what to do, exactly what percentage we should be investing or saving, exactly what to do. But the reality is those rules of thumb do not work in real life. Every single person here has been told exactly how many gallons of water they should be drinking every single day. And likely none of us do that, right? And so we're adults here, we understand that rules are good to wrap our head around, but they're not so strict that they stop us from thinking about money from a much wider perspective. And the last thing that I think is probably the most important part about having better conversations about money is recognizing the role that culture plays in the way that we think. And obviously we know that culture influences the way that we think, the way that we act, the habits that we have, but many of us don't think about the role that culture plays in how we think about money. We're obviously showing a sign here or a picture here, which is an image of the Hindu uh, festival, Holi. Now, I don't know much about that, but I do know that in American culture, we love cars. And I can tell you my arch nemesis is car culture, right? I think I just saw a recent article that said that the average car note is now up to $700 a month. And I wanna say people are financing them for upwards of 84 months now. I think when we started doing our research, that number was around 60, but it's slowly creeping up and up. And so why do people do that? Because they love cars. My wife uh, loves cars. She comes from a long line of car and truck lovers in Texas. And so it, it's taken a long time to get her to respect that culture, that's who she is, that's who she comes from. But it doesn't mean that that's how she has to manage her money. And so it's something that we are mindful of, respectful of, but we wanna make sure that we don't allow that to dictate the way that we think about money. And so we're gonna walk you through uh, a couple of concepts from our book uh, that we think are gonna help us have better conversations about money. The first one is what we call the purpose of income. The second one is really all about how to make money grow, which is what most people are really, really interested in. Thank you very much. And the last one is uh, going to be a concept that we call the 15 year career. So I'm gonna pass the mic to Kirsten and she's gonna take us from here. All right, so we're gonna start with the purpose of income. And this is a concept that came to us after speaking to a couple of college students. We were at Auburn University back in 2020, and we were doing a similar workshop like this, it was a little more hands-on, but it was with students and faculty at Auburn University. And one of the first questions that we asked them was what is the purpose of income? and nobody had an answer. Everybody in the room had ambitions to get great jobs, to have long careers, to earn lots of money. But when we asked why, what is the purpose of income? There were no answers. And so we put this chapter early in our book, I think it's chapter three, because it's such an important concept before you go into your financial ambitions and goals and create these plans that you understand that in America, in a capitalist culture, you have to give your income a purpose because if you don't, someone else will. So let's start with the basics. The very first purpose of income is security. So this is a matter of making sure that you have a roof over your head, you got food in your belly, you have the basic needs to keep you functioning as a human in society. So this is the baseline. And a lot of times people will call this a living wage, but we know that depending on your area, depending on your needs, how many children you have, your health backgrounds, that can be a different number for anybody. So the first thing you need to do is figure out what your living wage is. You take those baseline expenses from your medication to your rent, to any insurances and you figure out like what is your survival number that's the first purpose of income is figuring out to make sure that you that you have basic levels of security now if you are not making enough money at this time to cover your security baseline then you're what we call financially insecure and a lot of people don't relate to that term. Some people will call it the working poor. Some people will just call it poor, but it's a term called financially insecure. And it happens to a lot of people later in life. And it's something that we have to plan for and accommodate. But security is the number one purpose of your income, which is why it's so important to pay yourself first. Now, once you get a little more money over security, let's say you earn, you get that promotion and now you've got a little bit extra in the bank, it's not so tight, you're not living paycheck to paycheck. The next purpose of income is to give you some flexibility. So maybe you settled for a one bedroom apartment, but now you're ready for a two bedroom. Or maybe you had a older car that had, you know, 
manual locks and now you want something that opens when you approach it. Whatever that is, flexibility is the next purpose of your income. It doesn't mean that you have the best of everything, but it does mean that you can evaluate those things that you might have traded off at the beginning and say, I can do a little bit better. I can improve it just a little bit. Now, the challenge with flexibility is that this is where most people get stuck. They stay in flexibility forever. So every pay raise they get, every job increase they get, every merit, every bonus just goes to improving their baseline living arrangements. And there's a term called lifestyle inflation. Now, we all know about inflation inflation, which is what's happening right now, where you have no control over the cost of gas and bacon and rent and all of those things that are moving because of all of the factors that are happening in the world right now. Lifestyle inflation is when you make a conscious decision to improve your life little by little. You make a conscious decision to buy nicer clothes, bigger purses, faster cars, top newer shelf houses, alcohol. top shelf alcohol, <laughs> if that's your thing. And people just get stuck in this forever. And anytime you get stuck in this cycle of flexibility, always increasing your lifestyle, it makes it feel like you are earning more, but you never feel rich. You never feel like you are living the success that you've worked so hard for. And so we always warn about flexibility because people think this is the purpose of income. The purpose of income is to just keep getting nicer and nicer things, but actually the purpose of income is to get to these next two steps where your money is actually working harder than you are, where you are putting your money to work and you get to relax and kind of lean back and enjoy the sunshine. So this next level of, this next purpose of income is independence. This is often called financial independence, FI. You might have heard of the FIRE movement, which we might get into a little bit later. But financial independence is the point when your money makes more money than you do at your job, right? You have a portfolio of investments, whether it's stocks or real estate, maybe you have a small business, whatever it is, work in the traditional sense where you are exchanging your time for money, where you're coming in and getting a check, that becomes optional to you. You can still choose to do that. In fact, we've just been on a book tour in multiple cities and we've met several people that are financially independent. They don't actually have to work, but they still come to work for some other reasons. They come to work because they're fulfilled. They come to work because they like the benefits. They come to work because their friends are there. Whatever the reason is, it's very different when you're working because you want to versus when you have to. Quick, quick correction. I apologize because we, we do get chipped up sometimes. Financial independence isn't defined by the point where the money that you have uh, is replacing the money that you earn. It's the point where the money that you have is growing and earning enough income to replace what you live off on an annual basis. Right. So if you live off of fifty thousand dollars, you could be making fifty five. But if you have a retirement portfolio and a real estate portfolio and other things that are replacing or providing you with fifty thousand dollars, you now have a choice between whether or not you want to go to work every single day or you want to live off of the income that these other assets are creating for you. Thanks. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, now I've lost my point. It's all right. <laughs> So within financial independence, I think the beautiful thing, and, the, and to Julian's point, you know you've hit it when you have choices that didn't reveal themselves to you previously. So before you might feel stuck in a job, you might feel like you have to take a certain path, you might feel like you have to do only these one or two options. When you hit financial independence, when you reach that goal, the world opens up in terms of what's available to you. You might decide that you still wanna work, but you would take a lower paying job because it gives you more flexibility and allows you to do things that you're passionate about. You might decide a part-time job is the, is the right way for you. You might decide you just wanna work seasonally or start your own business or do nothing at all and travel the world and go back to school. Whatever it is, you have those options when you reach financial independence far more than you have them when you're just struggling to be financially secure or you're still stuck in that flexibility treadmill. And then the last step is freedom. Freedom is when you truly, truly, truly can do whatever you want. And it's more of a feeling than it is a number. Financial independence, you can back your way into a mathematical equation to figure out 
what what number you'll be at when you're financially independent. And we can talk about that formula or a couple of approaches to that formula during the Q&A section. But financial freedom is a state of mind. It's when you know that you have enough money to be happy, content. You don't need to make another investment. You've got, you've got it. And we actually just met a couple who embodies financial freedom. They have a military background. They're in their mid fifties. They spent 10, 15 years doing real estate investment and just stashing away most of their money. They're about to get married. They were previously divorced. They're just a beautiful couple. There's a lot of examples of financial freedom that don't look familiar to us because so many times financial freedom is depicted as Elon Musk levels of wealth or Oprah Winfrey or Barack Obama levels of wealth when really it's a decision that you make to say, I don't need a bigger house. I don't need faster cars. I don't need new clothes. I have enough and I'll make this work through the rest of my life. And so freedom is something that ultimately is the purpose of money. America was built in, in the sense that you have to continue to work unless you decide that you're done. Unlike every other milestone, whether it's student loans or mortgage, you can take out a loan to cover the cost if you don't have it up front. So if you wanna go buy a house right now, no one is asking you to produce $250,000 of cash in order to have that house. Now with retirement, you have to have the money up front. Yes, you can get social security. Yes, if you have a job where there's a pension, you can rely on some pension income or maybe some 401k income, but even that you have to contribute to. Financial freedom is the only aspiration in America that isn't funded by banks. You have to do it yourself. And so knowing that as you earn your income, as you continue to strive through your careers is a really important message to make sure that you're setting yourself up for success later in life. All right. So Kirsten mentioned this, if you don't give your income a purpose, someone else will. Uh, Ideally, you want to think, well, who are these people <laughs> that are taking my money? Well, we're not trying to say that there are thieves out there, that there are people out there who are literally trying to uh, take your money. But in some ways, that's what marketers are for. That's what they're paid for. And they are very, very good at what they do. Take it from me, because I used to work as a marketer. We have droves and droves of data, from your credit card data to where you live. We know exactly what you want, when you want it. And so it is not a mistake when you all of a sudden feel like this might be a really, really cool thing to buy. Someone was working on that last year and they were targeting you to make sure that they got your good, hard earned money. It's not a bad thing. It's just the way that this world works. There's a way to capitalize on that though. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but I also have a picture of a family up there. And that's not to suggest that your family, even though some of us may have some aunts, uncles, and cousins who like to ask us for money. If we're being honest, you might be that aunt, uncle or cousin, but that's okay. The point that I'm trying to make here is that family and life happens, right? You never know. Like maybe it's time to celebrate someone's graduation. Maybe it's time to go take that trip because you don't know when you're going to see them again. The point we're trying to make here is if you don't be very clear upfront with your savings or investment goals or whatever it is, you will find a reason to spend it, right? And that is just human nature. And so this is really about planning our money and our income to make sure that we have enough uh, in order to uh, move forward into the next stages of that framework that we presented. Okay, making money grow. I said this was the most exciting part uh, because this is where a lot of people get really interested because everyone wants to be rich. Everyone wants to take a dollar bill, plant it in some soil, give it some water and sunlight and let that be the thing that uh, creates the very first money tree. Um, but here are a couple of ways that we know for sure, uh, all three of which we've done that really help uh, to make money grow. These are not the only three, but we're just briefly gonna walk you through some of these just to make sure that you're aware of how this all works. Uh, the first one is investing in real estate. If you've ever read a book about money or investing, you'll know or hear about the importance of real estate. And I already know what some of you guys are thinking. It seems too hard. It seems it's way too expensive. I don't identify with being a real estate investor or I don't want to be a landlord. Those are all valid responses, but we're going to talk about some of the other ways that you can actually invest in real estate that don't require you to be up at two o'clock in the morning changing someone's toilet. 
The second one that we're going to talk about is investing in the stock market. And I also know what you're thinking there, which is like, all right, that means they're going to throw a bunch of numbers at me and use a bunch of fancy language. And it's going to get really intimidating. I promise you, we're not going to do that. We're actually going to recommend our favorite and tried and true uh, way of investing in the stock market that I think anyone can wrap their heads around. And we'll talk about that. And hopefully if I'm feeling frisky, I'll throw out an example and see if I can prove the point that I'm making. And the last one is around starting a business. And I know what you're thinking there as well. Like I'm not an entrepreneur. I don't wanna be a founder or a start a company. And I certainly don't wanna manage people. We're gonna talk about some other ways to think about starting a business and ways to earn income. But first I wanna talk a little bit about real estate. And so there are two primary ways that I would ask you guys to think about, I'm sorry, to ask you to think about uh, real estate, right? There are hands-on ways, and then there are hands-off ways. I'm a hands-off kind of guy, uh, and so I prefer those ways, but you could be hands-on, and that's perfectly fine. Again, going back to what I was saying about uh, having better conversations about money, it's not about which way is best, which way is better. One of these might be best for you. Another way may be better for you, right? So the first one in terms of being hands-on is buy and hold. This is what we did for a relatively short period of time. I'd say about five years. Buy and hold is when you buy a property and you hold on to it. You allow it to appreciate in value until eventually you sell. And that's actually one of my least favorite parts about that, uh, about that term, buy and hold, because they don't ever talk about the sell part. If you wanna actually get the money and take advantage of having bought the property for less than you actually, uh, for, for selling the property for less than you actually bought it, you have to actually sell it. So buy and hold is one of the true, tried and true ways of uh, getting into real estate. Wholesaling is another way. It's a little bit more elaborate. And what wholesaling real estate is, is it requires you to actually find the property, get it under contract, and then you would sell it to someone who actually wants to own the property as a buy and hold investment or someone else who actually wants to sell it. It's entirely up to you. But you're not actually holding onto the property for any long period of time. You're just doing your part to find properties that are within your budget and then you're doing the other part, which is finding someone who's willing to buy it from you. So I'll use a quick example using very low numbers. Find a property for $100,000 because you believe you can sell it for $110,000 to someone who's looking for a property that costs $110,000. It happens every single day. It happens all the time. I don't know much about auctions, but I'm sure if you looked up auctions, you find those kinds of deals. Or maybe you know someone that does that, but it happens all the time. So it's just something to think about. And the last one is what you've seen on HGTV. That's when a couple like us walks around with mallets and they walk into older homes, they bust through walls, they tear down things, they look nice and pretty on TV and in 45 days they sell the property for three times what they did. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but it doesn't happen like that on TV with a lot of people. That's It's called entertainment for a reason. I've never flipped the property, but I know several people who've done it. It's incredibly hard work. And like I said, I'm a hands off guy, but you may know someone who likes to tear through walls. You may know someone who likes to rip through floors, who likes to walk in with a mask on to protect them from all the mold and all of those things. They may like those things and that's perfectly fine. As I said, you may prefer something while someone else does. That might be an opportunity to partner with them. And then you can focus on doing any of the other parts that get that deal to close. Some of the other uh, ways to be involved in real estate uh, that are hands off that I think are a lot easier, especially for those who don't like to pick up hammers and do any of the other stuff is short term rentals. Airbnb is one of the best examples of that, but they're not the only platform. That's basically when you buy a property and you kind of treat it like a hotel room. Um, you sell out your rooms, not on a six month lease or annual lease, but you sell it on a nightly basis. It might be every two nights or something like that. But those are all ways that you can be involved in real estate without actually uh, buying it. This is the internet age. So you can actually buy real estate online. You can buy cars online and you can buy rental properties online. You can buy rental properties with a tenant out of state online right now. So long as you're willing to put the money up and I'll say one other thing, you can find a property out of state with a tenant and have a management company who was willing to manage that property for you so that you're not flying back and forth from Cincinnati, Ohio to 
you know, Nebraska to Atlanta. You can do all of that online and your job is just to simply make the deposit and to allow somebody else to do that. So that is the world that we're living in. I'll give you one quick website uh, and it's up there, but it's a little faint. It's called Roofstock. Dot com. We also have a long list of resources on our website, our richandregular.com, but that's one of our favorite resources. The last one I'll say for anyone who's interested in hands-off ways of investing in real estate is through um, investment trusts or real estate investment trusts. They also go by the name REITs, R-E-I-T. That's a great way for you to get involved or invested in commercial rental property. So I live in Cobb County. I've been in Atlanta for the last 20 plus years. I remember when they were building the battery and I could be totally misspeaking here, but that is the type of property, mixed use properties that are um, also made available, rolled into these types of investments and they give you or you or you opportunities to invest. So you can say, yes, I own a little piece of the battery or yes, I own a little piece of Atlantic Station or I own a little piece of this other mixed use property. These are things that are readily available for you guys and you can buy a share in these commercial properties through uh, real estate investment trusts the same way that you could actually invest in a mutual fund. So those are six ways. Those are not the only ways, but we've categorized them by hands-on for people who like to wield hammers and hands-off from people who don't want to touch a broom. Either one of those are great ways for you guys to start building wealth and thinking about it. And you can start with just a couple hundred dollars. All right, I want to talk about the stock market and um, these two gentlemen here, um, are, are, are heroes in my eyes. Uh, one is Warren Buffett, known as the Oracle of Omaha. He's the CEO. Uh, I don't believe he's the chairman anymore. He may be both. I think he uh, sat down. Yeah, he's the CEO. He's 91 years old. He needs to. He needs to go ahead and just retire. When you're a billionaire, opinion. 91 feels but, very um, different. Warren Buffett is, without question, one of the world's most renowned real estate investors. He's also someone who can likely do complex mathematical. Uh, calculations in his head. He can read financial documents like a wizard or a magician, which is why they call him uh, the Oracle of Omaha. I am not recommending that any of you try to copy, mimic, or do any of the things that he does besides his recommendation. His recommendation, and you can search it on Google or anywhere you want, is to do what Jack Bogle, the founder of Vanguard, uh, has recommended, right? His recommendation, Warren Buffett's recommendation is that most Americans would be perfectly fine or well suited if they just invested in a simple low cost index fund. And the person who created the index fund is that gentleman, Jack Bogle, who passed away uh, just a few years ago. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what an index fund is and why it's our favorite right now. So any fans of basketball here, any big basketball fans, all right, I'm going to put you basketball fans on the spot. Who's going to win MVP in the next upcoming NBA season? You're a fan of basketball. Who? Trey Young. Trey Young. <laughs> Clearly an Atlanta fan. <laughs> LeBron James is going to win at 38 years old. Okay, any other recommendations? John ja Morant. Morant. Okay, somebody's clearly from Memphis. Any, <laughs> any recommendations over here? Who's going to win the MVP next year? Embiid is going to win. Okay. Um, what are all of the things that might happen that would stop Joel Embiid from winning MVP next year? Injury. What might stop John Morant from winning MVP next year? Probably injury. Any other things? Maybe just having a bad year. Maybe they feeling like Russell Westbrook, right? The same thing happens in the, in, in, in the stock market, right? It doesn't matter who wins MVP next year. What matters is I guarantee you, all of you people are going to watch the NBA next year, right? How many people are going to watch an NBA game next year? How many people are going to go to an NBA game next year? Okay. How many people might go to several NBA games next year? Okay. Then you understand how and why it's important to invest in an index fund. Let's say we weren't talking about John Moran and we were talking about Amazon. Let's say we weren't talking about Trey Young and we were talking about Phillips Electronics. Let's say we weren't talking about Joel Embiid. We were talking about Wells Fargo. All of these are publicly traded companies. I actually don't know if Phillips is or not. I may have just made that up. Apple. My point is, no one can predict what's going to happen. But what we can predict is these companies have a vested interest in staying in business for the long run. And you don't have to try to pick which one is going to win. You can buy all of it. 
And that's what a total stock market index fund is. It's the difference between saying, I'm smarter than you. I believe that I can pick which winners are going to win and which losers are going to lose. And that's what's going to make me rich. If you're an index fund investor, you say, I don't really care who's going to win. I just know that the U.S. and global economy is going to keep on ticking and it's going to keep on churning profits. And I'm focused on that. And the benefit of that is that it is significantly less expensive to just bet on the game, right? That's what it means. When you're trying to analyze and you're crunching all those numbers and you're watching the game and you're hearing all of these analysts talk fancy talk about this is the first time this person has ever done this since 1960 and all of this data, all of these talking points, great entertainment. When you're investing, you don't need all that. <laughs> you can simply say, you know what, that's fun. That was entertaining. I'm going to buy a little bit of all of it. I'm going to trust that this thing is going to keep on going for the foreseeable future. And if one team or one player or one company uh, falls out, guess what? I'm willing to bet that somebody's going to replace them. Name a car company that's now out of business. Anyone. I'll give you one. Begins with a P. Pontiac. My mom used to love her, a good old Pontiac Trans Am. She used to sell Mary Kay. And she would love her, what was it, a pink Cadillac? It was both of them. She loved both of them, right? The point is, they're not here anymore. They've been replaced by newer car companies. Name a newer car company. Tesla, okay? Same thing happens in every other industry, right? So you don't have to pick. You don't have to even get that specific. You can just buy a little bit of all of it for a fraction of the cost, and that can be literally your path to building wealth. Um, the way that that works with an index fund is you're not trying to what they call beat the market. And the way that you measure how well the market is doing is by a term that you may have heard. You're like they talking about the Dow Jones Industrial Average or the S&P 500. These are all ways to measure how the stock market is moving. And it goes up and down, up and down. With an index fund or a total stock market index fund, they're not trying to go higher than where the market is going. They're simply just trying to follow the market. And if you just do that and follow the market, we know what happens over time, right? And it is significantly less expensive. So I will reiterate what Warren Buffett said. You don't have to be as smart as me. I'm misquoting Warren, but this is basically what he was saying. You don't have to be as smart as me. Do what Jack Bogle has asked us to do or created for us. Buy it all. Don't overcomplicate it. Don't think too hard about it. Do that consistently and it will pay off over time. I'm going to speed through a couple of these because I know we've got um, a few other things to talk about. Um, let's talk about starting a business. Uh, one of the things that we've learned with respect to talking about money and starting a business is that it, it is one of the supremely most intimidated things that people can think about, right? They don't like, I don't like selling. I'm not good at math. I don't have the, I didn't go to school for these things. The reality is starting a business today, particularly with respect to the internet, is far easier than it has ever been, right? Um, and we've done it a couple of times. But one of the things that we um, are also a part of is what's called the creator economy. And I'm not going to get too much into that, but maybe you've heard the word influencers or something like that. You can basically get paid to be yourself to communicate with your audience. And if you can do that well, build an audience, there might be people who are willing to pay you to put things in front of that audience or to promote, right? So it happens every single day. It's called the creator economy. Um, another way of starting a business, brick and mortar, that's just another word for building, right? You have a building, maybe it's a franchise, maybe it's not a franchise, but you have a building, a place where you have, it could be a hair salon. Any of those things are great ways for you uh, to build wealth. Um, and the last one is my favorite because no one is perfect and no one knows it all. And it's very similar to what we were discussing with respect to real estate. You may find someone who's really great at selling and they can be the wholesaling person. You just do that. But you're the person who really wants to focus on making sure that the paperwork is in order. Great. And then you find a cousin or a family member or someone else who's really, really great at tearing through walls and ripping up floor and doing all of those things. Before you know it, you've got a really nice, strong team that can allow you to uh, start a business or, or invest in real estate. And so it's something that I really would encourage you guys to think about. Switch up the conversations that you're having with your loved ones, your family and friends, and see how you might be able to uh, form a partnership uh, in some respect. 
All right. So bring it on home, the 15 year career. So this is a framework that actually comes right after the purpose of income in our book, because it's so important that you begin your career with the end in mind. And the 15 year career isn't meant to be taken literally. So if you've been working over 15 years, doesn't mean that this still can't apply to you. It doesn't mean that you have to start right out of college or you know, at some point in the journey. It's really a framework to, to show that spending a focused amount of time on accomplishing a financial goal, there's very little downside to doing that. So we've broken up the 15 year career into three five year sprints. And as you're listening, you may realize that you're already on year 11, you're already on year six or seven, and you can start to tweak your plan accordingly so that you can check the box on some of these things. So the first five years of a career or any five year point in your career should be focused on making sure that you are that you have established the financial foundations that keep you financially secure and allow you to move through those purposes of income. So if you have debt, whether it's student loan or consumer debt, if you have a car note, if you have a mortgage, whatever it is, you're spending five years really focused on bringing that balance down as much as possible and establishing really good financial habits like budgets that you can count on, a solid emergency fund, um, making sure that you're paying yourself first. So if you don't have savings accounts for future purposes, making sure that you're establishing that really healthy balance for finances. You spend five years doing that and really just understanding how much money you need. What is your, your baseline living wage? And hopefully it doesn't take five years and you can skip ahead. But if not, in years six to 10, that's when you graduate to the next level. And at work, you're spending time figuring out what your superpower is. So a superpower is something that you're really good at that hopefully allows you to make money outside of your nine to five as well. So a lot of times we get really good at a skill, but the only place we practice that skill is within the constructs of a nine to five, not knowing that that skill can make you even more money outside of it. So if you are a project manager, a really good project manager, you may only spend your time working on projects at work, not knowing that there is some let's say real estate contractor that needs a person like you to organize all of their vendors. And they do. And they do. They really do. <laughs> yeah. And you could make a couple of extra thousand dollars a couple of months a year out of that. Now, a lot of people will dismiss that money because again, we're trained to think about income the same way we think about wages. We think that unless it's covering our entire, uh, our entire salary, then it's not worth it. But if you know the purpose of income, if you know what your income can do for you, if you're investing it and letting it work for you, then you don't dismiss the $3,000 that you can make as a side hustle or the $5,000 that you can make as a side hustle. And you start to think more expansively about the kinds of side hustles that you take on. A lot of us default to things like driving for DoorDash or Uber or, you know, some of the other kind of gig economy skills. But if you're a professional and you actually have uh, skills that are valuable to other business owners, there's a lot of people who could use them. We, we hire um, a, a administrative assistant, an executive assistant to help us with our business. She still has a full-time job, but she pulls in about 10 hours a week with us, which gives her an extra eight to th 800 to a thousand dollars a month that helps her invest and fund her investments so that she can retire sooner. So just think outside of the box. There are all kinds of websites that are there to match people with skills, with people who are looking for them. And so in this year, six to 10, you're not only finding your superpower, you're also learning how to monetize it, whether it's through a side hustle or through a promotion at work, and you're investing along the way. This is such a critical time because you're learning how to not only earn streams outside of work, but also put that money to work for you so that you are accelerating whatever goal that you have. Then you move on to years 11 15, through 15. At this point, you got 10 years of professional experience under your belt, which means the likelihood that you can land another job is pretty high. You're not entry level anymore. You've got a professional network. You also have an investment portfolio of some sort under your belt, so you're not financially insecure. You've got an emergency fund. You've got stocks. You've got a retirement account. This is the time where you start planning your exit plan. This is the time where you start thinking about what else could I be doing? You might decide 
that what you're doing is just fine, but you want to put yourself in a position that the moment that it's not just fine, you actually feel like you have an opportunity to lead. It goes back to that freedom that we were talking about. You can either exit off your career in general, in total, in our book, we give a couple of examples of people who by year 11 or 12 had enough money saved, had enough um, ideas for income that they were able to walk away from their jobs entirely. You might decide that you want to change industries. Maybe you are an educator or a doctor and you've been burned out from the last couple of years and you'd like to go be an art teacher. This is the moment where you start planning that exit in years 11 through 15. And by 15 years after doing consistent financial habits, investing along the way, developing your skills, expanding your professional network, you now have an opportunity to reevaluate what you wanna do with your life. And it's such an incredible feeling to have that. And so we talk all the time about this framework and give several examples in the book of how to navigate each phase. Cool. So this is just a little bit of a recap, right? This is about getting you guys to be financially fit. It's about getting you all to have better, more productive uh, dialogue about money, whether it's with yourself or with other people. Uh, it's for you to think uh, differently about ways to earn money. Um, again, this is a bit of a high level overview. Um, I will also say this with respect to the second part about making money grow. We talk about this in our book. Several other people and authors who've written books uh, tackle that same subject. I'm telling you right now, how do I say this? <laughs> you will be tempted to second guess whether or not that is, whether or not it is that simple, right? And there's a reason for that. It's because people are out there, and by people, I mean financial institutions. I do not earn a commission if you decide to put your money in um, index funds, but I promote it because I know that it is the best way that has helped us to achieve financial freedom. It is like the people's champion of investment approaches, right? It's not complicated. You all can understand it. You just prove that with respect to knowing that none of us actually really know who's going to win MVP next year. It's the same way with respect to companies. So I just want to reiterate that because one of the things that we're uh, a bit sensitive to is that money is, for good reason, very, very complicated and intimidating. And there are a lot of people who will try to overcomplicate it because they have something to gain by confusing you, by getting you to keep asking questions. That's why they're there, right? So that you can come to them. I am not a licensed financial advisor, so I cannot tell you specifically what to invest in, but there are people who will gladly take your money and allow you to do that, right? I'm just putting this out there as something to think about. It is an option for you. Again, going back to what we were saying before, this is not either or. I would encourage you just to do it and then you can see for yourself. You might decide that, you know what, today I listened to this couple talk about investing. I'm going to go ahead and open an account, invest in an index fund. And I just want to see how that performs relative to what my uh, advisor or planner or whatever it is does. You're entitled to do that. And I don't see a world where they'd be upset about that. But I'm willing to bet that after 10 years of looking at that money grow and learning about money, if you were to compare that growth to whatever you're doing uh, with your planner, you're going to have the same aha moment that Warren Buffett had when he bet one of his financial advisor friends $10 uh, a million dollars in 2007. You can look it up. The big bet. He bet that all of this fancy data and analytics wasn't necessary, that if people had just put their money in an index fund, they would come out better. And he ended up winning that bet. And so I'm willing to bet that if you did the same thing, that you would win that bet too. So the last thing that I'll say, we typically open uh, talks about this, but I think it's an important one. Um, and it's a brief story about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, you know, he was arrested several times. I think if you know anything about him, we know that he was arrested. And this one particular time he uh, was arrested, I don't remember exactly where it was. It was the early 1960s. It was him, uh, Ralph uh, Abernathy, and a few others, probably Andrew Young or John Lewis. And he's a man of principle, as we all know. And he decided that he was going to uh, not pay the fine, which at the time was $167. Uh, he was a man of principle. He was going to do the time. He was going to stay there for a week, but he was actually not able to do that because on the second day, he was bailed out by an anonymous donor. And we know that this is something that actually would happen time and time again. They would go somewhere. They'd have a peaceful protest. They'd be um, unlawfully locked up. 
and then they would be bailed out by anonymous donor. Um, we did the math to figure out, well, how much would that be in today's dollars? That $167 would have been somewhere around, I wanna say $2,000 or something like that once we adjust for inflation. Um, considering today, 50% of Americans could not afford uh, a $500 uh, immediate charge without having to put it on a credit card or go into debt in some way. Um, you have to wonder whether or not we would be able to advance many of the causes and beliefs that Dr. King was really supporting um, during his time here. And so it's one of the reasons why we, we always talk about this because we know that talking about money, talking about building wealth can oftentimes come across as a very selfish endeavor. There might be a bit of an internal conflict inside where it seems like you are putting yourself first. You're not thinking about your family. You're not thinking about others. But I would encourage you to, to think about the anonymous donor and to think about your act of building wealth and, and, and helping or being in a position where you might actually be able to help other people. And, and, and maybe use that, if that's what the true motivation for you is, to tap into that sense of feeling and say, you know what, as a wealth builder, as someone who has the means, I can actually use that to solve a lot of problems and advance society the way that I want to see it. And so there are other purposes for building wealth. We obviously spoke about the purpose of income, but the purpose of building wealth is significantly larger and greater than that. So we'll close on that. Uh, and then we will pass the mic to Kenneth, but we can also open it up for questions. Maybe we'll open it up for questions and then move on, but we'll, we'll leave it up to you guys. Thank uh, you. Well, first of all, well, thank you guys very much again. And let's give them a round of applause for um, sharing the insight into the, sorry, uh, into, you know, the uh, financial independence and, and and making your money have a purpose. Um, before we open up the questions to the audience, I have a few peppers right here. To, you know, they, they control the the content, so they know exactly what they were going to say, but they don't know what I have. <laughs> okay, my question because I, I, I'm gonna really get the conversation going. So the first question that I have that you really get it going is, um, you guys look very relatively young. Yeah. Um, just tell us if you're comfortable sharing your age. You know, what, how old are you and, and when did you make the transition? When did you make the decision that your money was going to have a purpose? And when did you get out and say, okay, well, now I, I'm really living my purpose right now with my, my funds. Uh, at what age did you make that decision and when did you jump out? Uh, I'm 42. I made the decision when I was 24. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was sitting on the stairs with the woman that I didn't marry. <laughs> I'm glad that worked out. Um, and I was just sitting there just talking about like some of these wild and crazy dreams. When I was like 24, 25 uh, is when I said, you know what, I'm going to uh, think differently and act differently with respect to money uh, because I saw my mom struggling, quite honestly. And I was like, you know, I feel like I'm going to have to support her any day now. And this paycheck isn't going to cut it. And so I got to get creative. I want a better quality of life. Um, and uh, I felt like money and business was my superpower. And so I realized that I wanted to focus on that. And somehow I ended up here. I was a little older. I'm 38 now. I finally got my financial life together a little before I was 30. So probably 29-ish. It was after I had met Julian. Before that, I was living a typical American life, which was mostly subsidized by credit. I had a very expensive Midtown apartment. I had a luxury car. I had every shoe, every bag, every she did. brand, <laughs> everything. And I just assumed that I would out earn it. I was really good at work. I was getting promotions. I was in retail at the time working for Target and then moved to Atlanta to start working for a, a hospitality company. And I just, I was having a, a good run. I was in my twenties having a great run and getting promoted. And then I just assumed it would, it would continue. And when I met Julian, he was the first person that kind of gave me the reality check and asked me the questions like, how far do you think this would go? And tested my assumptions, would pull up org charts of companies that I think I thought I could work for and say, now, how many people do you see that look like you? How many people do you think could do what you think you're doing and why haven't they done it already? And so that was the first kind of reality check for me to realize that like, 
even if things are going well, the likelihood that it continues for 40 or 50 years with no disruption, no change of income, no illness, no mourning, no mental health issues, fatigue. no fatigue. It was the first time I had really thought about it. And that's when I decided that I needed to pull back on the spending, double up on the investing and really let my money go to work. And 10 years later, to your point, like here we are. And I think that's a good um, starting point for our conversation because, you know, the perception that, you you know, you have to wait until a certain age to make this transition yeah. is really and truly the commonplace. Oh, oh, God forbid, you need to have that trust fund. You have to be a trust fund baby to be able to, oh, yeah, they were trust fund babies. Like, no, so I assume the answer is no, you will not a trust fund baby. Um, but I, I think that was this, this, the stigma and the message that we're trying to get out to the employees that, uh, especially those young employees that join the organization. Uh, and amazingly, when you, you're, you're 15 and out, is really a, it's part of the concept that goes into what we were talking about with Fulton Gets Financially Fit as to the, the years of a government employee working 30 years, 40 years, is dead, you know, yeah. the reality of the situation, especially as pensions go away and within Fulton County, we no longer have a pension. Mm -hmm. So we have to figure out how do we attract the next generation, yeah. put them on this path, let's get about good 10 to 15 years out of them and then get the next generation in uh, after that. So HR, you know, that's the cue, you know, so it's 15 <laughs> years, anybody more than 15 years, we have to get them out and get the new generation in. Um, but I, I wanted to start there because we're trying to, we're trying to speak to that population to get them interested in their money, have those conversations, make those tough decisions, but the tough decisions now will have much more financial benefit, you know, 15 years into the future. I think that's a really good point because to your point, there is a perception that you have to have buku money to be an investor, to invest in general. And at some point in history, that was true. But in 2008, when we went through the great recession, everything changed. There was this emergence of fintech, financial technology, because all of the banks had lost consumer trust. So what it did was it gave Silicon Valley and the smart people out on the West an opportunity to swoop in and offer the same services that banks and brokerages used to have really high barriers to entry to offer that for consumers. So before you used to have used to have like a, used to have to have a minimum of like three thousand dollars to open an account at Vanguard, which is still true for Vanguard. But other brokerage houses have come along and said you can actually invest as little as one dollar. If you have $10, you can invest. Before you used to have to buy an entire share of stock. If you wanted to own Tesla, you had to be prepared to write $700 to own a share of Tesla. Now you can own a fraction of Tesla. You can buy what's called a fractional share and just invest what you have. If you only have $25, well, you now own $25 of Tesla or, you, or Disney or GE, whatever you wanna buy. So there's been a lot of advancements in financial technology and in the financial space that to your point, a lot of us don't know. We still think you gotta have that minimum $25,000 to work with a financial advisor. We still think that you have to like fill out a form to buy a stock when really, if you can download Spotify or Netflix or order an Uber, you can buy a stock at any point. You can buy a mutual fund or an index fund at any point. It's that seamless today. Thank you very much. Um, and before we, we we open up, and you said we had some questions online as well, but we're not as yet. Okay, cool. All right. So you know, I, I am you know, psychology is my training. Um, uh, I went to Morehouse. Uh, I got my BA degree in psychology. So I sit back and I observe. I, I love to sit back and watch people watch. So when I saw you guys coming in today, you were holding hands, walking down <laughs> over there. And I saw, like, oh, that's so cute. A couple, okay, that talks about money. But most couples talking about money is completely taboo. Oh, yeah. you know, most couples that I know, and probably even in my household, you know, me and my wife would rather go get a root canal than sit down and talk about money because it's so personal. It's, well, I bring in this amount, you bring in this amount. Why can't I buy my red bottom shoes? Why can't I buy another rally chopper? You know, if you, you know that's, if you know me, I'm, I've been, I've been buying bikes like crazy since the, um, um, uh, COVID started, but as a couple, how do you guys navigate that? What advice 
would you give to other couples that are either here in the audience or listening as to broaching those conversations where it's not putting someone in a defensive corner, talking about, well, why do you buy that red bottom shoe, whatever the case might be? What's the difference between that shoe and the shoe that you got from Marshalls? What, what advice do you have for that couple that really want to have the conversation, but they're scared because it just brings so much tension? into the relationship? Um, lots, lots. And it's difficult to, to give any one prescriptive piece of advice uh, besides normalizing having conversations about money, starting small, and then rolling that into more frequent conversations about money. Uh, our first conversation about money actually led to a breakup. <laughs> uh, and it was, it was my fault entirely. Um, it was after we, you didn't have to. It was his I said fault it was entirely. My fault. We knew it was my fault. Thank you very much. <laughs> but no, it was my fault. I, I, I had uh, really strong beliefs, uh, flawed beliefs about money uh, because I grew up very, very poor. And so when I saw her and how freely she was spending money, it actually made me uncomfortable. I felt like she was wasteful and irresponsible. Uh, and I just had all of this baggage. And so I would start there with trying to... Um, be clear on what kind of baggage you have, right? And how you were raised and how all of those things, even down to your religious values or spiritual values, how those things shape the way that you engage with your partner about money. Because that was certainly my case. I brought in a whole heap and dumpster bag of, of, of baggage uh, that had absolutely nothing to do with her. And I used it to uh, to wrongly judge the way that she was managing her money. So uh, that's that's one piece of advice. Since she's a little better at it than I am, I'll, I'll let her answer the second part or offer additional thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I am someone who's conflict avoidant and I, I definitely felt defensive every time Julian would ask me about a purchase because I felt like I had to defend things that my check could afford. Um, but I will say that my biggest piece of advice, the most help, helpful thing that I've remembered is that conflict isn't always a sign that something has gone wrong. You also have to learn how to welcome the conflict because it's the only opportunity for growth. You're both whole adults who had whole lives and whole relationships with money before you got together. And so naturally there's gonna be some conflict and we offer several, we wrote a whole chapter on this because it comes up so often. We offer several um, frameworks to help you deal with the conflict. One of them is recognizing that conflict is a dance. And when you recognize that he's not the problem, you're not the problem, the topic is not the problem, but your interaction, your interaction patterns are what you need to hone in on. You need to figure out why you may feel defensive if you're asked about this thing or where you may feel shame from a decision that you made earlier in life. You have to uncover some trauma and some history. It's a lot of inner work there. But once you recognize that the conflict isn't necessarily a sign that your relationship is failing, it makes it a lot easier to go into that with curiosity instead of just judgment. Like, I don't understand why we keep having the same conversation. There's going to be a lot of the same conversations as you're both growing and evolving as, as humans. I think a lot of people think financial advice and financial literacy is set it and forget it. We treat it like a driver's license test where it's like, I proved I could drive when I was 16. And so now it's just a matter of getting new pictures every so often, but it's not like that. It is truly a third wheel in your relationship. It's an ongoing thing. It ebbs and flows. All of the assumptions that you have that it's consistent and that it consistently grows and that somehow at the end you get a prize is somewhat of a myth. You actually have to nurture it and treat it and talk to it and learn about it and treat it like it's a it's a part of your relationship and it's work. So that's my advice is just to treat it truly like a third party in your relationship and and welcome all of the things that come from that. I'll offer one uh, one other thought and, and this is not to make light of it but money is the leading cause of divorce and separation in the United States, right? And so it's one of the reasons why we decided to actually get really passionate about getting on the same page because we wanted to avoid uh, divorce. 
Um, and, and by the way, divorce is really expensive. <laughs> like it is really expensive. If I'm not mistaken, I'm seeing some heads shaking for some people who, who probably know firsthand how expensive it is. I want to say the last set of data I saw said upwards of around $15,000 just to go through the process, right? And so it can set you back a lot. So you really want to prioritize getting on the same page uh, with your partner with respect to managing money. Okay, well, you can say that, but just invite me to your next party. <laughs> so we could have those conversation, Ambrojo's conversations, because, you know, I, I, yeah, okay, I'll just, I'll stop there. All right, so um, I've asked two questions. Are there any questions from those individuals that are here? Yes, Coretta. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Wow. You're welcome. <laughs> Congratulations. Sure. So the question she had, just in case everyone couldn't hear it, was with respect to emergency funds and where you should be storing them. Uh, you do have the option to invest your emergency fund, but if you're not the type of person who is very comfortable with the amount of income that's coming into your life, or if you don't have any other places to um, uh, cover those kinds of charges, I think this is what uh, high yield savings accounts are for, right? So you've got savings accounts and then you've got what they call high yield savings accounts, which are pretty much the same thing, but they typically require a, a higher minimum balance uh, that you need to have unless until they unless they'll charge you uh, a fee, which is normally nominal, but if you can avoid it, you can. But a high yield savings account is likely the best place uh, for you to to store an emergency fund. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, Coretta, I, I applaud you because you know the, one of the questions, you know, we um. The mere fact that you just logged into your retirement account, you know, I, I think most of us don't log into our Empower account yeah. and have the app on our phone and get the dings every time those deposit hits every uh, uh, two weeks. So I, I think that's that in itself is a good first step, uh, just knowing what you're and I think what you were talking about was the fees, you know, the, the, the fees could be significant. Uh, versus what you might be able to get if you just rebalance your portfolio within your uh, Empower account. So congratulations on that. The fund that I was investing in was extremely conservative. Mm -hmm. And um, I think because when I started college, um, I, <laughs> my major was risk management. Mm. Um, and um, you know, taking those business classes, the whole stock market and all that stuff, it, I'm not going to say it intimidated me, but my salary at my earned my income, not income, my hourly rate at that time was $3 and 75 cents. Yeah. And I had a kid. 
So I couldn't see me saving, yeah. Yeah. you know, while I'm taking for my child. So, um, so that was like, oh, that was avoidance. No, I need to just figure out the future value of money and go do, you know, do that kind of stuff, reinsurance and stuff like that. I had my mind on that. Yeah. Um, but no, it was a, the fund that I was investing in because I said 100% in here and just leave it when I first started with the county almost 10 years ago. And that fund was extremely conservative. Mm. And, um, and, and I, so we changed that. Yeah. We changed that to right. get a little bit more aggressive. Fund, yeah. Um, to put my money in. And it's all about balancing risk as a yeah. graduate of a risk. Right. <laughs> a risk also, degree. also, I want to say thank you for the retention bonus because that retention bonus is going into my uh, 457. Thank you. I appreciate it. Like I said, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, the, you know, the performance bonus that we we're now giving to our employees for, you know, and they have to meet uh, certain criteria. And it's not individual. It's a team approach. Okay. So we have to first make sure you as... Uh, well, no, you, you live in Cobb, but citizens of Fulton County are relatively happy. So we have to get that 80% um, customer satisfaction rating to even open up the pot of money that the Board of Commissioners has um, uh, provided us. And then each individual department also now has to meet their individual key performance indicators so then all the employees can share in the department's windfall of, I've kept you know, employees happy. I've done training that is X, Y, and Z. Uh, and I'm glad to hear that, you know, employees are happy about the performance bonus. I'm happy that we're able to give it, but I'm equally, um, um, you know, enlightened and, ha and, and even ecstatic was probably the word I was looking for that they're taking that performance bonus and dumping it into the 457B plan. Yeah. Um, the 457B plan is probably the hidden gem within Fulton County, where the, the county would match an additional, I, I always get this wrong, Virginia, what is it, up to another 2% of your contributions up to a certain thresholds. And Hakeem, I apologize in advance right now, but it's less than 5% of the county's workforce that are participating in the 457B, yeah. which as you know, me and Stacy, who is my deputy, we talk about you know, our exit strategy and we've now learned that that 457B is a great exit strategy if you want to bridge the gap between uh, accessing your 401A plan mm -hmm. without um, receiving a penalty because you might want to leave before 59 and a half. So in order to do so, you have to maximize your 457B, folks. Um, you know, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. And if you're strategic and aggressive, you might be able to dip out uh, before the 59 and a half threshold or before the 62 or 65 threshold if you're waiting on social security. So again, just take some time and look at the, the 457B, reach out to our partners in the benefits office in finance, and they'll be glad to walk you through that. Um, there are several, several. Do we have any online questions yes, right so now? So we're going to entertain those at this time. Sure. Yes. First question. Where would you look to try to open an index fund? Uh, you can, uh, well, you so see, you're not opening an index fund. You're opening an investment account. Um, and you can do that in any number of places, uh, especially now to Kirsten's point. Uh, how many people here uh, know what Cash App is or have Cash App on their phone? You can invest in Cash App, right? We use it to send people money or to pay the guy the parking uh, deck or something like that. Uh, but you can also invest in Cash App. Uh, you could invest uh, with Fidelity, Vanguard, Charles Schwab, any of those Ally, uh, Ally Bank. Uh, there are digital banks. There are uh, robo advisors, which we absolutely love. How many people here know what a robo advisor is? Ooh, I love it. So a robo advisor is not like a robo cop and you go into a bank and you've got a robot. Um, but it is uh, artificial intelligence and technology sort of combining with market analysis. And so these days, let me ask you a different question. How many people have ever heard the word algorithm? All right, so algorithms, that's basically all it is. Robo advisors are software algorithms that manage the market that you put in what you're trying to accomplish and they will use all of their power and ability to analyze all of these complex things while they're happening all at once. 
um, on your behalf. And so robo-advisors uh, like Acorns is one. If you're just starting out, uh, Acorns is an app that you can download. And if you go buy lunch and it costs you $11.45, it'll round up the amount from $11.45 to $12. Take that remaining change and invest it on your behalf into fractional shares. Like Kirsten uh, mentioned, most of those shares are going to be index funds uh, for the most part. Companies like Betterment is likely one of the bigger ones that are out there. There are others called Wealthfront and so on and so on. So any number one of those institutions uh, can, um, can uh, are up to you to be able to invest in. The way that I think about it is it's like asking where's the best place to buy your pasta sauce. I don't really care where you buy your pasta sauce. Maybe you like Piggly Wiggly. Maybe you like Publix or Target. Maybe you're going to get it at the gas station. It's the same pasta sauce. This might be in a different jar. And maybe if you're getting it at the gas station, it was probably sitting there for a while. So I wouldn't recommend it. But the point is you can buy these funds with different brands. They still work the same. They still accomplish the same thing. Some of them might be $40 a share. Some might be $200 a share. They're technically still the same thing. They're just packaged a little differently or are operated through different brokerage or financial institutions. So, so long as you focus on buying index funds, it really doesn't matter, or it's up to you to pick whichever one you're most comfortable with or whichever one is most convenient for you. Next one, Brenda. Okay. Tari, hopefully that answers your question. Next question, uh, I think we could answer internally a little bit from Faye Payne. Do, all, do you all offer a class that helps to get someone started on the right track? Now, we do have the retirement classes, and we have these Mr. Herman, you want to? Uh, well, I, I, the answer would be that's phase two. So yeah. we, we want to start a conversation um, uh, about becoming financially fit and then start the individual classes on whether it's investing, whether it's Know Your Credit 101. Uh, uh, we, we, uh, a few years ago, right before the pandemic, and we're trying to get that relaunch right now, we talked about um, introduction to home ownership and walking them through that entire path. And I, I'm proud to say that uh, we have about nine brand new homeowners within Fulton County that went through that class, work with the real estate agents and the banking relationships that we created, and they're now homeowners. That's the last count that I have. So more classes are to come, just be um, mindful, you know, read Focal News, uh, look for the various announcements or reach out to the employee development team to see what's on their uh, schedule so you don't miss that opportunity to, to learn a little bit more. Okay, next question um, from Faye. Also, do you have to be out of debt before you can start investing? No, you do not. No. You do not have to be out of debt. I know that there is a very popular... Uh, financial media personality that highly recommends that. Um, it's at, at the end of the day, it's up to you, but to answer the question, no, you can invest with any number of debt that you have. It's up to you and whether or not you're willing to assume that risk, uh, risk of loss of that money, risk of income, um, or just risk of you know using your income to invest for future growth instead of paying off debt. But no, you do not have to be out of debt. You do not have to be at zero before you choose to invest. The problem with that approach is that if it takes you 10 years to pay off that debt and you've chosen not to invest, that's 10 years that your money could not have grown. We speak to couples all the time just to show you how simple it is. Maximizing, if I'm not mistaken, a, a 401k plan, which is the you know, for-profit uh, or business equivalent of a 457 or a TSP. 401a. Four, okay. So... If you max those accounts out, I believe it's at $22,500. If a couple did that you and you invested consistently, assuming a standard rate of return, you'd have it a million dollars in 15 years, right? By just doing that, doing nothing else, right? And so it, it really is just that simple. Obviously, you know, you've got to manage your other costs of living and things that you want in your lifetime, but 
if you decided not to do that and to use that 15 years to just pay up debt and not uh, invest, now you're 15 years down the line. And to Kirsten's point, life happens. Your kids are older. You're tired. Uh, you know, maybe someone gets sick or maybe someone in your family, something happens. You've missed out on 15 years where all of that money could have been grown on your behalf. So, uh, no, to, to go back to the original question, you do not have to be out of debt before you start investing. You can do both at the same time. And I'll add that, you know, uh, my assumption is Faye is a county employee. Faye, you are already an investor, depending on when you started. If you started after we ended um, uh, the defined pension plan, uh, so, yeah, the, the, yeah, defined, yeah, the DB plan, you're, you already have a 401A that, you know, the, you're contributing 6%, the county is matching 8 uh, but like the other concern that with the other uh, question that we had earlier, the question is, how are you managing that current um, asset and the risk level that you've uh, identified within that portfolio that you've um, invested in within your 401A plan? And are you leaving money on the table on your 457B? Because that one you have full control over. That can be $20 every payday, that extra $20 that you're no longer spending on, you know, Starbucks coffee, you could put that in your 457B every other payday. And then when you cut out McDonald's, no, sorry, that's me. Um, uh, you cut out McDonald's, uh, then you put that under additional amount in and it, the 457B, you have the, the flexibility that if next month you really need to buy that Starbucks coffee or the McDonald's, you could send that notice to the finance department and say, hey, stop that contribution. And uh, I need to get this coffee and this, this, you know, this um, the McFlurry if the if the things are ever working, uh, and then start it back the following month. So, um, so you are already an investor. The question is, how are your investments working, and what are you doing to make sure that your investments through the county are maximizing the, the highest potential return with the risks that you're willing to tolerate. All right, and I know this gentleman had a question. Crystal Hathaway has a question. Is this five year, six year, 10 year, 11 year, 15 year plan, a plan that will work for a single parent? Yes, yeah, we encounter several single parents, single people with no kids, divorcees, widows, all sorts of people, absolutely. Now, it may not work in exactly 15 years. I don't have enough about your financial situation to answer it specifically, but focused amounts of time building financial habits, establishing your superpower and investing in the market and planning an exit plan will work regardless of your, of your marital status. Uh, yep, and our first presenter, um, Jackie was Kosky. a single mom, made a decision and in 10 years, she was able to achieve the financial independence to allow her to pursue her passion. So um, take opportunity and go look for that video because that was a very interesting uh, conversation that we had uh, a few months ago with her on her journey to financial independence. I'll just add though, it's a lot easier when you've got dual income, right? Like I don't wanna be dismissive of that fact. So if you're doing the math in your head and saying, yeah, but how? Cause there's only so much you can cut back and then you're absolutely right. Again, we don't have all of the details, but respectfully, we do get that question everywhere we go. How does that work if it's only one of you? And, and I would say, you know, in the book, we speak about that. Like, this is really where focusing on income uh, is likely more important. And so cutting back is probably not going to be the best bet for you, but finding other ways to bring in income, whether it's through real estate, whether it's a side hustle, whether it's leveraging the internet and finding other ways to create and sell something or partnering with someone else, but figuring out other ways to make your money grow and to work so that you don't have to is likely what's going to be most important for you. Right. Uh, you said that it was a question in. Yes, yes, we yes have sir. A couple more. Well, let's take one local and then we'll go back. Hello. Okay. Um, well, just to tell you about my situation, um, I'm looking close to retirement. Uh, last year, uh, my brother died unexpectedly, so I had to fly to Houston, and I had no way to get him home back to Dayton, Ohio, right? So 
I went and looked in my the fund, our retirement fund, the uh, I guess what was it called, Empower, and they said you can use it in emergency for a burial. What I found out, to your point, I never looked at it. Um, I found out it was a nice amount of money in, in there, and uh, so I looked at my financial situation. I bought a house a few years ago. Always made an extra payment. What I have saved up now. I can pay off my house. Um, I had a side hustle, uh, started a business. I had to stop it because of COVID. My goal was to make an extra 500 a month. I started making that a week and almost a day, but I'm getting too old to do that. So I paid down all my debt. I have no debt except my mortgage and my car note, and that's under $5,000. My credit went down because I paid everything off. So yeah. they, they force you to get some more credit, you know? So I had to go get some more credit cards to raise it back up. So if I ever needed a loan, I wouldn't be paying more. They're still at zero pretty much. But what I want to know is when can I retire? I mean, you know, <laughs> what would be a good time for me to say, okay, uh, my dad, he left me some farmland in uh, Coweta County. So my plan is I bought my house out of foreclosure. Um, it's worth about three times what I paid for it. Uh, my plan is to maybe pay off what I have, the rest of my um, mortgage, go put a trailer or something up on my farmland and just rent out my house. You know what I mean? Um, I want to know how soon can I do that? <laughs> or, you know, like, dude, you might want to wait some, or are you good to go now? Or, I mean, and I'm really interested in the index funds because I go through Ally. So, do you have in investments through Ally? You can invest through now? Okay. Um, I mean, uh, do you think with all those things, and I, I'm really wary of the stock market. I used to work for MCI. I was a top salesman. So I'm thinking I'm doing the smart thing and mm -hmm. putting my bonuses in stocks. MCI I'll, stock? Yeah. $60,000. Yeah. Gone. Okay. I had to start all over. So now um, I'm, I'm getting older. You know, gray hair. Uh, I'm trying to figure out what's a good time where you're like, okay, I left too early or how do you figure that out? All right. So I can help you out with the retire piece. Um, what's your current, what department you work with? Uh, tax assessor. What job? Uh, appraiser. They're easy to find, right, Stacy? We could easily find replacement tax appraisers. They're on the key classifications. Okay. All right. So, uh, I, I was going to tell him, you know, based on how hard it is for me to backfill his position is when, <laughs> you know, when he could retire, when he could leave. We could post it again. Okay, so that, that sounds like your job is a little difficult to backfill. So you might have to give me a little bit more time before you, um, you um, jump out. But hey. I, I, I don't know if, and I'd allow them to speak for it. Um, um, you know, everybody's, you know, situation is extremely unique. Uh, and I don't know if they have enough information to tell you what's a good time. But what I, from what I heard, you you are on the right path of making sure that your investments are working within your 450, 401A. Um, you have some, you're, you're paying good on your um, your mortgage and your car payment. I'll tell you one credit card hack that I that I um, that I learned because I had the same situation that you ran into. You paid off all your credit card bills, you stop using them, six months goes by, and they start telling you, well, I'm gonna close this account because you haven't used it for six months. But let me ask you, do you have Netflix? I do. Do you have a cell phone? I do. Do you have a cable bill or any other bill? I do. All right, so this is what I did. I had six credit cards, and now each one of those bills go to one of those credit cards and I pay it off in full. So now my credit rating is now. Oh, okay. Roof. So you're still using them and you would have paid those bills in full no matter what, but it's not sitting dormant on your credit report. So that might be one trick you might want to okay. explore from a credit card perspective to keep your credit rating up high, but definitely not incurring any more 
debt beyond what your current monthly expenses are. And that's free from me to you. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, you don't have to, because uh, I think you used the word they, they forced you or you had to get more credit. You didn't have to get more credit cards. But I certainly understand the allure of wanting to keep your credit score at a certain rate because you're right. If you stop using your credit cards or if you start closing accounts, it is going to have a negative impact on your credit score. And if you do at some point need a loan, you are likely going to be uh, charged a higher uh, interest rate on that. To answer your question, I to his point, I don't have enough information, but I can tell you this having had thousands of conversations with money about money with people, if you're asking the question, you probably aren't where you need to be. And that doesn't mean you don't have enough money. It just means you're not clear on exactly how much you spend every single year or how much your future requirements are going to be between where you are right now and when you can actually start to safely withdraw that money from any of your retirement accounts, right? So I would say go take some time to think about some of those basics, get really clear on how, before you make some big move, like paying off your house or starting to withdraw from a retirement account, get really clear on how much you spend every single year, know what that number is, and maybe add like a five to 10% cushion, right? Then you can make a, a much smarter uh, determination as to how many years you could live with that same quality of life based on the income that you have, whether it's social security, whether it's regular frequent withdrawals from your retirement accounts or any other sources of income that you have. So all of those numbers combined should on a monthly basis be enough to support you. And if you don't know that, then you need to find out what those numbers are. The last thing I will say is we don't know whether or not we're entering into a recession, but there are several indicators that we are likely entering into a recession. And so if you are not clear, which it sounds like you still have some answers to that, and working uh, more to collect more paychecks isn't like killing you, I don't know that it's a bad thing to continue to collect those checks just until we start to see some type of softening or adjustment in the stock market. Because what you don't want to do is to start withdrawing from some of those accounts without knowing exactly how much you have or how they're even allocated. Like You want to make sure that you're doing several things. And it might be worthwhile just speaking with a financial planner, uh, a certified financial planner. You, you, you can do that. Uh, pretty easily. Like we just search for certified financial planner, preferably someone who is a fee only planner, not someone that's going to ask you to transfer all of your money to them. Someone that you can just set up an appointment. You might also be able to get this done for free through a nonprofit organization, right? So there are several banks and organizations that might be out there that can help you say, all right, let's add all of these things up. Let's look at what you spend on an annual basis. Let's also look at your insurance and all of those things so that we can make a, a, a an intelligent an evidence-based decision about how many years you can live with the same quality of life. Uh, uh, what about a fiduciary? Would that be something that you might look, because they, they don't make yes. money until you do, right? Yes. So it's not that fiduciaries don't make money. They do, uh, but they have a vested interest. They are legally required to make decisions that are in your best interest. And we didn't get into that, but the word he's referring to is a fiduciary. And I hate to break it to you, most financial advisors are not fiduciaries. They are not legally required to give you recommendations or advice that are in your best interest. I'm going to repeat that. And I'm sure it's, it's confusing and it can be scary, but financial advisors are not legally required to make recommendations based on your best interest. They can make a recommendation that suits them as well. And I use that word on purpose because they follow a different standard, not a fiduciary standard. They follow what's called a suitability standard, which is like a little lower, right? So I can make a recommendation for you because I like you, but I also know that I'm gonna get a little kickback on the side. It's suitable, it's gonna grow, but I'm gonna get a little kickback on the side. Whereas the best recommendation is likely going to come to you from someone who is fee only and likely a fiduciary because they're legally required to do that. And those are the recommendations that they're going to make for those reasons, because they don't want to lose their certifications. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, yes, Tisa.
have any recommendations for maybe savings that you cannot touch? I want to put this money over here and every month put a set amount or, or whatever and I not have access to it. Because if, if it's in my bank account, I'm going to spend it. Yeah, so you so are you talking about investments or savings? Is it money that you're planning to spend in the next couple of years or money you truly want to sit for a decade or two? Savings. Okay. So going back to what Julian recommended, the high yield savings accounts, there are several digital savings accounts that don't have sort of brick and mortar stores. They don't have debit cards for you. If you want access to that money, you gotta wait at least 48 hours for it to be transferred. Ally is a great one that people recommend because Ally allows you to create savings buckets within your account. So you can have a savings account that has $1,000 in it, 200 of it on paper are allocated to car repairs. Another 500 is for your Christmas gifts. Another 200 is for the vacation you wanna take. And so anytime you log in it, you can see where that money's supposed to go. And it just kind of is a mental reminder that if I move this, I'm taken away from my Christmas gift. I'm taken away from my vacation. If my car breaks down, I don't have the money. And so it's a little bit of behavioral psychology. It's not going to prevent you from getting your money because it's your money at the end of the day, but it does give you pause in that it's not instantly transferred to your account and you can't just spend it. It's not attached to your debit card. What would happen if you spent all your money? I'd be broke. You'd be broke? Uh -huh. okay. I, I like, can you be more specific? Would you lose your house? Or? More than likely, yes. Okay. And, um, and and what else would happen if that happens? We'd be home. Do you have children? I do have a son. Okay. Now, I pay my bills, but I mean, that money that I should be saving, I'm spending. Yeah. So, I need to change my saving habits. Yeah. And the, the most disciplined way that I know how to do that is to not have immediate access I, was the same I, way. I don't think that that's gonna gonna help respectfully <laughs> i was the same way and it didn't help it much. did help <laughs> she put her credit cards in a block of ice i did i did you can melt the ice like that's not gonna <laughs> but i don't you. i mean because even you can with cut that, up a my... credit card and then you can order another another credit card my point is i i, I i'm gonna give you a different recommendation okay. which is to seek community you need to know what it looks like and smells like to go to continue walking down the path that you're walking on. And I take this up very seriously because I want people to understand what's at stake. You might be unfamiliar with what it feels like to be homeless or homeless with children. Well, I certainly am, am unfamiliar with being homeless, but I'm certainly not unfamiliar with not having financial resources. So I would probably be a first generation person of financial resources. I have credit cards that I don't touch it's just my saving habits are not where I want them to be. Yeah. So I'm trying to learn how to save better. And the other side of that coin is, right, like seeking community is not just to see what happens if you continue to walk down this path, but it's to see what it looks like if you walk down another path. Spend time around retirees. Seek out people who are making those decisions so you can see, actually, they, they're still making trade-offs. They're happy, but you'll find out that a lot of retirees are not living the pina colada life on a beach. Some of them are comfortable, right? So you might it might actually help you take the edge off of what you're actually working towards. And I say that because oftentimes when people think about retirement, they think in these extreme lengths and like, I'm never going to get there anyway, so I'm not even going to try. And more often than not, the answer is typically somewhere in between. And, and in our book, we actually talk about that too. This is really appropriate because like we opened the book talking about our parents and we're not talking about money in that sense, but we're talking about our parents who, while we were writing the book, her father uh, was um, diagnosed with cancer and my mother had a high blood pressure issue that she couldn't uh, get over. Both of them were admitted and both of them, we went to the, the doctor's appointments and the doctors pretty much told them, all right, well, here's what we're going to do. But here's the thing. They knew what they needed to do, right? We all know what we need to do, which is why we don't spend nearly as much time going through the numbers because I'm convinced that this is a behavioral psychological issue. This is a cultural issue. This has nothing to do with your intellect. Every single one of you here understand the secret to building wealth because I just told you, and I was probably not the first time that you heard it, right? 
might not be the first book that you read or the second book, but we live in a world where it's actually really, really difficult to do the best thing. We all know we should drink more water. We all know that we shouldn't jaywalk. I jaywalked coming into a government building and I was thinking something was going to happen. I ran a red light, actually, <laughs> mistakenly thinking, you know what, I'm probably going to get yourself. something in the mail. But we know we shouldn't do these things, but we do it anyway. And money and the way that we manage money is no different. So I'm not saying this to judge you. I'm actually saying this to help you realize that it's actually quite normal. I applaud you for being honest yeah. about where you are, but I'm also helping you out that, hey, you might put those credit cards in, a, in, in the freezer in a block of ice, but I'm pretty sure you're smart enough to know how to melt ice, mm -hmm. right? And I so those systems and things, you can't put it in jail, right? There's always gonna be a way for you to get that money out. Yeah. But I do think, that role modeling has been the most important thing that actually helps people get over the hump because it helps them visualize what their life would look like if they made certain decisions, good or bad. If I continue to eat poorly, if I continue to not do these things, if I continue to spend money irresponsibly, I'm going to be like this person or these people. If I actually do the right thing and I'm courageous enough to overcome my discomfort, I might look like these people. And hopefully when you see that, you can say, you know what, I prefer this over that. And I think it's, I, it's a combination of both. Like I'm a mom too. And you might be on a willpower, you might have a willpower deficit. It sounds like you're trying to do this through willpower. You just leave it in there and you're going to like outthink it. And in a season of life where you have been using willpower all day, not to yell at the kids, not to cuss somebody out at work, not to honk your horn in traffic, you just add a deficit and your money takes the L. So it's a combination of automating it out of your account immediately, putting it in Ally or whatever high yield savings account that you use, labeling it to know what it's there for. And then to Julian's point, surrounding yourself with role models who have the thing that you're looking to achieve, who spend their days and their vacations the way that you want. And it starts to kind of retrain your brain that this is actually what's best for you versus buying more stuff. And, and you know, if you want to put it into a, what we call a financial jail, um, you could give me it. <laughs> You'll hold it for it. I'll hold it for it. <laughs> you know I will hold it for you. You will never have access to it, even though how much you complain. But the only bad thing, it, it wouldn't earn interest. Um, <laughs> if you want to get as close to a financial jail, I, I have to put some of my, my parents' resources in. Um, you might want to explore going to what's it called? Treasury Direct. They have the series I bonds. You could buy up to $10,000 a year. You put it in. It's extremely hard to get at can't it. Can't get it out. Well, you can't get at it, but you mm -hmm. will lose, what, I think, like three months of the interest and some penalties, whatever the case, if an emergency comes up. But that's the closest thing to a financial jail that I've been able to see and, you know, on my research as to how could I get it out of sight, out of mind, but at least it's growing it's available you could put it in you know your, your son could be a beneficiary and allow it to grow for the next 30 plus years for when he needs it uh but that might be um some some advice but i i, I do agree that it, it it also starts with you know surrounding yourself with individuals who are on the same path you know it it's extremely hard to say well i'm going to save with someone and then you sit next to somebody who is going to go to Louis Vuitton yes. and buy a $900 bag and you can look at them and say, how could you do that? You know, um, because you're on a different mindset. You don't have to give them up as a friend. You just have to find another friend that say, well, yeah, I, I, I'm going to go to, um, I'm going to bring my, 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 my work in my, um, my Walmart bag, you know, your Walmart plastic bag. That's how I'm going to start bringing my stuff to work and not the Louis Vuitton. <laughs> oh, but again, Lord. you know, you could, you could get there. You could get there. Uh, any other questions before we go back online? Because I think we got about 15 to 25 more minutes. I had maybe one more question. Sure. So I also have the 401k, a 401a. I have a 457. Um, and then I have, because it has been so far the easiest for me, an account with Robinhood. Now, I know you all have mentioned Ally quite a bit. I don't know much about it, but what do you feel about Robinhood or those type of stock accounts that people like me who have no idea how to use the market doing using the market? 
Are you using your Robinhood to actively trade or are you just buying and holding funds within it? I've done both. Um, and then I've also recently bought some stock with Cash App. So I'm just trying to get comfortable, I guess, with purchasing first and then knowing kind of which direction I want to go in to make those uh, stock purchases. And then some of them I have sold that I don't think have been performing really well. So. I am a very, uh, I have a <laughs> strong opinion about Robinhood. I'm not a fan. Um, and I would say specifically for you, the way that you described yourself um, as someone who, who has a, would you say a willpower deficit? It, that would be the equivalent of getting a job in the mall for you, right? And the reason why I say that is because Robinhood has figured out an incredibly creative way to make actively engaging with the app fun and engaging, which is why so many people like it, because it feels like a game. But investing your money is not a game. It's not supposed to be It's fun. not Candy Crush. <laughs> it's just, it's boring. It should be boring. <laughs> it should be simple. It should be like paying a bill, right? And so when you gamify it, then all of a sudden you're thinking, ah, oh, well, I'm going to move this. I'm going to buy this. And oh, I heard this thing on Instagram. And so I'm going to go ahead and buy this thing because this person said that this is going to go up tomorrow. Nobody knows what's going to happen. What we do know is exactly what Warren Buffett recommended. And I'm telling you, that's probably the best way that you can do it. Now, I'm not saying that's the only thing that you can do. I think a lot of people who have more than enough invested in simple, broad-based, low-cost index funds owe themselves an opportunity to engage uh, in, in, in riskier activities, right? So you, you at some, some point, reach a point where, you know what, I'm actually willing to, uh, I can more comfortably ride the wave uh, when uh, when the stock market goes up or when it goes down. But I think for you, based on the way that you described yourself, I would recommend uh, looking at a few other brokers. Uh, Cash App is fine. I don't really consider them a broker. They're just like a platform that you can use to engage. And I, again, we don't get paid by any of these companies. I'm not we're recommending them because they're top of mind and because we use them. But as I said, it's like asking, where do I recommend getting my pasta sauce? You can get it from any number of places, but I will say Robin Hood is one of those places that make it, that's like buying your pasta sauce from Dave and Buster's, if that makes any sense. It's just, there's a lot of stuff going on there that can distract you. It's my point. So you can go to a, bit, a place that's a bit more straightforward, like any of the other brokers that we recommended. Fidelity, if you wanted to go with the robo-advisor, Betterment, or any of those companies, I think could could help you as well without all of the gaming. Uh, Brenda, any more online questions? Uh, yes, we just have a few more. We have an anonymous attendee. Uh, some of us use the extra assistance to get financially stable and start our outside investment portfolio from our 401k. Why are we not allowed to go into our 401k? All right, so Hakeem is not here, so I'm not going to answer that one. Um, but I, I, I do know that our, our plan for 401a uh, does not allow individuals to like take loans or that kind of stuff unless it's some some hardships. And I know during the pandemic, the federal government allowed for some waiver. Um, so I, I, unfortunately, I can't answer that question in any greater detail. Um, so next question. Yes, and um, I guess I could just maybe say that 457 does allow you to, to take money. Oh, yes. So, oh, sorry, Versus I thought you were talking about a 401A. Yes. So I'm not sure what, you know, the anonymous, if that answers anonymous question. Um, we have Jewelry Man. Do you offer one or more investment meetings with couples or individuals? I'm assuming that's for our presenters. We do not. Uh, we do not offer those um, for, for several reasons. Uh, but... Um, trying to think if we could have some recommendations for, for couples are always a little difficult uh, to find because it's like recommendations for a marriage counselor. It's, it's kind of a very personal recommendation. I would say start with the book. It's more than enough of the fundamentals. Lots of books actually um, are, are really great. Um, I'm thinking Tiffany Aliche, the budget Nisa colleague of ours has a book called get good with money. That's great. Uh, they're, they're, Rachel Rogers is another, I'm trying to think, Ramit Seti uh, is another great book, uh, Cashing Out. 
<laughs> is a great book. You already said that. But um, <laughs> but no, we we don't offer that. It's something that we've thought about, and, and the reason why is because that's not respectfully how we like to spend our time. Like we're actually we're too passionate to coach people. Because <laughs> I'd get really upset if you weren't uh, able to do it. So I'm not qualified to do that. Um, as much as I, I feel like I might do it, because I, I I'd be very upset at you. Right. And maybe because that was one of my questions as well as to um, are, are there any groups because you talked about uh, yes. like minded individuals all trying to go down a, a, a certain path, starting at different points. Are there any local groups in Atlanta that you, either you are a part of or you know of or you might be able to recommend from Facebook or whatever that has like minded individuals yes. that can help individuals become a lot more comfortable with? So the ones that I participate are all on Facebook, um, but oftentimes there'll be local branches that will have meetups in the area. Um, One is for women, it's called Women's Personal Finance, WPF also on Facebook. It's got like 58,000 members. So it's very, very active and busy. Um, There's another one called Women of Color Pursuing Phi, which is on Facebook. Uh, It's much smaller, less active, but everybody in the group is a woman of color. The biggest one um, and the most active is called Choose FI, Choose Phi. And that one probably has 70,000 members, um, which is pretty big. And then you're in one, Afro. Uh, Afro's on fire, but also Choose FI has local organizations. So there's like a Choose FI Atlanta, Choose FI wherever else you are. So they've got local, uh, international, I think at this point too. So they're friend of ours, they do a great job. It's all free. Um, I would just caution that again, you're you're asking advice from 70,000 people, right? And if you ask a question, you're gonna get 70,000 answers. Most of them are going to be in line with sort of the principles and they're tried and tested. And even if there's a uh, difference in opinion, you will actually benefit from seeing that dialogue. You'll learn as a result, but you just wanna be mindful that you're asking, it's like crowdsourcing information, yes. but it's a great way I think of hardwiring uh, the way that you think, especially if you spend a lot of time on social media, because you're more often than not going to be bombarded with things to buy. It's nice to break that up with a community of people that are actually offering you sound uh, personal financial advice. And honestly, the most valuable part of any of these groups is the search functionality. So you can search within any group and just look up government employee and see any posts where somebody identifies as a government employee, read the advice that was given to them. If you're looking for college savings or car insurance. There are hundreds of posts that are gonna be far more valuable than anything you'll see on the first page of Google, which is what a lot of us do. And all of that stuff is just marketing. Yeah. Um, we have one more, Brenda? Mm-hmm. Yes, we have a few more that are coming in. Um, well, one question, I guess we can jump down to the bottom. Anonymous has a, a couple of questions, but uh, anonymous is asking what is choose fi you said that's like a uh, uh, a group like a chat group or- choose fi is a is a uh, community of people that are passionate about uh, financial independence and that's what the fi stands for they're choosing financial independence and to Kirsten's point it's a massive massive group uh, there's one large organization uh, that mostly congregates on Facebook, there's also a podcast. A so if you podcast. like podcasts, you can, they break down things by subject. You can listen to their podcasts to learn. Um, but they're also a Facebook group as well uh, where yeah, you can it's a, engage with other people. It's an educational platform. They have a um, huge podcast with hundreds of episodes from people with all different backgrounds on how they achieved financial independence. So again, if you don't relate to our story, which totally fine. There's a story out there that you can relate to, whether you're a flight attendant or disabled or a teacher, whatever it is, there's a story out there and Choose FI has likely found that person and interviewed them. They also offer courses and workshops and they have books on their website. So it's a, it's a great resource. Plenty of government employees and military um, veterans as well. Okay. All right. Um, Let's see, quickly, quickly. Um, I think you've answered, uh, Faye was asking about mentoring and you guys don't do that. 
So the next question, I'm trying to, Anonymous has a couple of questions. Let me see which one we can get in. Oh, the websites for uh, real estate investment. You said roof.com, rent.com. Is this correct? Roofstock.com. And then for the real estate investment trusts, we recommend fundrise.com, F-U-N-D-R-I-S-E, or crowdstreet.com, crowdstreet.com. And on our website, richandregular.com resources, you can get a long list of recommendations if you're looking for budgeting apps, investing tools, uh, those real estate companies are there, courses, uh, you name it, they're all listed there. Richandregular.com, and then you would go to the resources page where all of our recommendations are. Now we have one more question from the audience, and then we're going to turn it back to our panel to close it out. Okay. I'm in the audience then. Um, <laughs> so, we, you know, it's it's perfect timing. Uh, the, the, this is, a, the, I think, the best question that we could end on. It's that time of the year, back to school. Um, and, and we heard from uh, some individuals in the audience about being parents and being able to make sure that they provide for their kids. So from your experience, and I know you have one kid, two kids, okay. one. one. Um, so, so how are you preparing your child for their financial journey so that they could avoid some of the pitfalls that you guys may have had in your early 20s when you, um, you got over there, as well as balancing, you know, controlling their drip. I think that's the right terminology, right? <laughs> drip, their drip in school. You know, you know. And the only reason I I, I say that is because you know it's time of the year, and I I got my um uh, a text message from my son with the Nike inbox uh, of roughly twelve hundred dollars worth of sneakers. Congratulations. Yeah, you know, I, I told him congratulations too for you know that I I equated that to the you know having our the J.C. Penny Christmas catalog come out, yes. and we used to <laughs> pitch in the pages, and like this, I, I know I'm good, that all of those are going to show up. Yeah, but re realistically, you know, trying to get down. So, how do we get that next generation thinking early on? This two hundred pair of Jordans is great, but the one fifty that I could put into my Vanguard total index fund and take the $50 and buy a pair of Vans for a pair of Adidas, the classics, like, you know, that's oh, Reebok classics is really and truly all I need yeah. to get through, to walk on the same dirty floor in the schools and just splash in the water and that kind of stuff. So what, what advice do you have for parents trying to navigate that, educating the next generation and controlling the drip? I have a uh, probably a book worth of answers, uh, but I'll be brief. Um, we also write articles every now and then. We I happen to publish one with a website called nextadvisor.com. They're a subsidiary of Time Magazine. And uh, we've told the story about uh, a very interesting situation that happened about two years ago, I believe, in the early stages of the pandemic. Um, and I told you about the creator economy and some of the things that happen around how people can uh, earn money online. So one of these days, as we were preparing to start spending more time working from home, um, we went to Ikea and we started redesigning our basement. And our son, who was also home because daycares were closed, of course, he wanted to play. And so we said, all right, well, let's play, put together this, you know, bookcase. And so he's helping us put together this bookcase, or at least pretending to do so. And we took a picture of it because we're millennials. And we posted it on social media and just went about our business. About a year or two later, we got an email from a company that basically buys these kinds of pictures. They said, hey, I, I, we like this picture. We want to be able to use it in a marketing campaign or something like that. And they said they would pay us $1,000 uh, to use this picture, just a random picture. And it was not a great picture. Like, trust me, it was not great. And so we said, yes, that's great. Uh, and then we took that $1,000 and we could have spent it on a bunch of 
toys and trucks because he absolutely loves trucks and comes from a long lineage of people who love trucks. And so they, it's in his DNA. But we made a decision to do something different this time, which was to open a custodial account, which is, uh, in, in this case, it was called a UTMA account. Um, and that is a, an account that you can open for your children. Any of us who have children can do this. And we took that $1,000 and we invested it in a fund for him. And you, you joke about trust fund kids, but this is how it starts, right? I am not, you know, I didn't come from that, but that single decision, that $1,000, he's five years old right now, by the time he's 21, if we invest $1,000 every single year, um, between now and the time he's 16, he'll graduate with like $76,000. Our plan was actually to do at least like 1500 And in that case, he would graduate or, or have, I want to say like $120,000, $130,000 or something like that. And so for us, it's really a matter of being willing to think and act differently. That is not a financial hack. That's no different than saying, hey, I know a really great restaurant around the corner that you should go to. You may not have a company willing to pay you $1,000 for a terrible photo, but to your point, the Starbucks, the McDonald's, the decision to go out with the friend and have that additional drink, the decision to uh, react to getting another coupon for Bed Bath & Beyond or something like that. All of those little things add up. And it may not even be $1,000, but even if it's half that, wouldn't it be amazing if you were able to gift your child $35,000, $50,000, right, without them actually having to work? And so those are the types of things that we do, in addition to investing in his college 529 account, in addition to ensuring that he is properly listed as a beneficiary and some of the other accounts that we have and so on. So all of these things together and combined uh, and us serving as role models as people who are willing to trade off some of the nice, comfortable, and sexy things today in exchange for degrees of financial freedom in the future is exactly what we're trying to do, not just for our kid, but honestly, for our cousins who don't have you know, the patience or the ability to do those things. We One of the reasons why we said one is enough, because we was like, we have one, but we're likely going to be having to do this for our cousins his cousins, and so on and so on. So that's the way that we think. That's the way we at least want other people to know is available for them. Whether you do it or not is completely up to you, but it's our job to make sure that those things are, uh, or we assume the responsibility rather, to ensure that we know that we can um, we can do different things with raising children. Thank you, Mr. Herman. You can close it out. Like we open against a time um, schedule, but I, again, you know, um, on behalf of the HR team, the Fulton County family, I think just the leadership of the Board of Commissioners in Fulton County, first of all, thank you guys very much for uh, taking time out of your day to come and share not only your story, but advice on how we can move forward as government employees, secure that financial freedom while still delivering the highest level of customer service to the citizens of Fulton County. And for the employees, uh, both here and uh, uh, online, you know, thank you guys very much for participating in this manner. And, um, you know, this is just a start. Like I said, this is the start of the conversation. This is conversation number two of many more to come during the course of, you know, this journey that we're all going to participate in, in becoming Fulton County's financially fit set of employees. So, Again, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much to the HR team and the employee development uh, for making this possible. I, I don't know if you guys have any uh, closing remarks uh, before we completely shut down the YouTube feed. And, uh, oh, that's right. Uh, we did have um, one prize winner, and I think the first person to ask the question was Coretta. So Coretta, congratulations. Um, uh, the book is yours, but if you want to make uh, a financial exchange, in addition to just getting a signed copy of the book, let me know, I'll meet you on the corner um, uh, and we can talk about that. So uh, I'll let you guys have your final say and we'll close out there. We're gonna gift the other book to the woman in the back who confessed to having low willpower. <laughs> this is your gift for the day. <laughs> Thank you.
No, that's a great question. Someone asked how to purchase the book. You can purchase it anywhere books are sold. If you want it today, there are several Barnes and Nobles that have it in the area, or you can order it from Amazon. It's also available as an audio book for people who listen. It's interesting, about 40% of our sales have been audio books. Um, it's a six hour listen, so very easy. And uh, you can get it anywhere books are sold. Again, thank you guys very much. And uh, have a great day. Uh, be safe out there in the rainy weather in Atlanta today. Um, and like I said, look forward to many more conversations about getting financially fit. Thank you.